Well, the sander is pretty well done except for the guard. So that's what I'm going to start on today. And I'm going to model those guards pretty much off of uh, what you saw on the Kalamazoo belt sander. And I'm going to use aluminum. I do not have a bending brake here. So what I've done, and this is an experiment, I have scored this aluminum on the milling machine and I'm going to see if I can hand bend it fairly decent without too much wrinkling and I'm just using the bench vise for that so I'll be back in a few minutes if this works alright that worked very well now what I had done here and this was an experiment and it was successful I used this 90 degree end mill that's carbide from KBC and I just scored it oh, less than half the thickness of that and put it in that big orange bench vise that I have out in the garage and, and it bent. Of course aluminum is fairly soft to start with but I also thought there was a chance of it uh, uh, breaking or you know at that point which is a weak point. So and I got a nice square bend and uh, no other wrinkling or, or bending here. So what I'm going to do now is I have some notching to do and basically this is going to go around on this side like this couple screws there and I have to notch for uh, this collar here and a few other things. I'd like this to come up to about the center line of the upper wheel and now there's going to be a wraparound guard up here as well. Similar if not identical to this. It's about 45 minutes later and it's really quite tedious because it's all just hand fitting and uh, Bagasse and bagosh, but you can see that I've got this back piece fastened with really two screws. One was, well, three screws. One is a draw bolt through the motor, and then a couple up here. And I had to trim it here a little bit. I don't know if you can see that for that hand wheel. And it wraps around. Now, at this point, it's still way too long right in uh, this area here. So I have to trim it and allow for the door and hinges and all of that good stuff but what I have determined here is that I don't want the door to come all the way up like this well, that's not gonna show, all the way flush with this where there's going to be a screw to uh, close the door and fasten the door I'm going to have to be out from that just a little bit and then there will be a gap here which I'm not going to like uh, very well but I've transferred that dimension with a square and I'm going to cut this piece off on a line that will go through that mark right there and then the door will be hinged at that point more or less. I'm making progress. I've got the hinges on. You know, for years and years I've been stumbling around continuous piano hinges around the basement here. I finally got rid of all that stuff a couple of years ago and now I actually have a use for them. But I'm just going with regular butt hinges here, uh, two inches. And I might have a little interference with these screws here in the belt. I, I don't know and I might have to put the screws in from the other way or chop those off. But they might be alright. So. Anyway, uh, I did want the hinges on the inside rather than the outside, but they will be on the inside of this piece. And this is the door. I think I'll put it about like that. And still have to cut the door off. But uh, I'll see you in about a half hour after I eat and work on this a little more, and I'll get the door fastened onto these hinges. So, And I hope that's stiff enough and doesn't rattle around. But I believe that some of that springing is, this is only aluminum, will disappear when I have the door fast closed and fastened. That will stiffen it up a little bit, I hope. I'm making a little progress here, but be sure and watch my friend Harold at Amateur Redneck Workshop. He's constructing a belt sander at this time as well. I think it uses a longer belt. He's only into it a couple uh, chapters, but he, he did cast his wheels also, but not with a 3D pattern. Uh, like I did. Alright, so the door is on here, and hi Harold if you're watching this. The door is on, but of course it's way too wide at this point, so now I can mark it and uh, trim it to the size that I want. Now you'll notice that uh, 
Well, you already have noticed, I'm not working from plans, but my M.O. often when I'm building something is to construct it one piece at a time and then cut to fit and design as I go along. That way everything fits. Uh, I really like my method. Maybe you don't agree with it, but... All right, so I'm going to cut this. I've already marked it here. You see a couple marks. And then I will have to notch it for this tool rest, the same as the Kalamazoo did. A notch in the door so that'll close. Be back presently. Swings kind of nicely. Notice how I have it notched here. Now I may have to re-notch it if this tool rest is sometimes set at some funny angle. I've marked where I'm going to drill it. Again, I drill all the way through uh, both pieces. Then everything lines up and there's no disappointments, no pouting. Clearance hole in the outer piece, drilled and tapped into the angle iron. I tapped this hole here quarter twenty and that is to accommodate this little knob here. Now I keep on hand uh, quite a large selection of uh, knobs and so on that I've collected. They're all used over the years and I am just happen to be using this quarter twenty. I didn't have much here in the way of quarter twenty. That's obviously the size that I, I use the most. Now I may have to use a washer here or something to keep this door from getting pulled too far in because at, the, at this moment it's fairly dangerously close to this wheel or not that that would hurt anything <laughs> but it doesn't quite hit when I tighten the knob down but if I and I can put a washer in there but I almost guarantee that's something that's going to be so easily lost but this door has to come open of course in order to change belts but you can see now as I draw this in and tighten it that I'm pretty close here but but it is not touching also I could remove some of this here because there'll be somewhat of a of a open space here anyway but that's the way it'll be for now and then I'll troubleshoot it as I go along you could also use a knob here that uh, instead of having a thread coming out of it is a this is way too large of course but the, the nut type you don't want it so large it'll, it'll interfere with your workpiece when you're actually abrading something but I'm fairly well satisfied with that now one thing that I need to do and I would, uh, I'm not going to do it on camera, but I really want to put some Loctite on all of these screws. These haven't even been tightened up yet. So that they don't rattle around. Now, I think I might have some of that Loctite that I can just put on in and it wicks its way in. Otherwise I have to disassemble, put the Loctite on and then reassemble. But it's darn near done now except for the top guard. The purpose of the top guard, as far as I'm concerned, is to keep sparks and debris from following the wheel around and literally throwing it into your face because this is about the height of your head, depending on what bench that you have on. So this deflects all of the debris and, and the sparks, causes it to go straight down. So to me, this is probably more important of a guard than the other one. So what I'm going to do here, and this is made of steel, I'm using aluminum simply because I have a lot of it and it's uh, easier for me to cut. I don't have a shear. This is about two and a half wide. I've already uh, cut a piece uh, of aluminum that size. It's extra long. You know, I always start with extra long. And uh, it's about five inch diameter. That's two and a half radius. Well, I looked over there at the chuck on the Hardin's lathe and that's a five inch chuck. So I'm going to wrap this around. But of course, there's always spring back. So I'm not sure what uh, actual uh, radius or curvature I'll, I'll have here from wrapping it around a 5 inch chuck, but I'll give that a try and if it was steel I would spot weld that, but the way it is I'll either have to use a couple pop rivets or other mechanical fastener some way or another and then I need to fabricate this uh, U-shaped bracket. There's not much light here, but this is a 5 inch diameter chuck. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, 
and you can see that it did spring back quite a bit so I'll over bend it and see what happens but I don't want to end up with a crease here I want it to look uh, uh, like a nice curve all right I think I'm gonna have to find a a four inch uh, pipe and wrap it around the four inch. You never know how much spring back you're going to get until you do it. But there was quite a bit of spring back here. Well, there's one of the extra four inch wheels. I should have done that first place, shouldn't I have? That's it. Well, there it is, cut off to size, deburred, the corners rounded. What I like about working with aluminum, it's not so lethal and uh, likely to lacerate you like a, a piece of cold rolled. The only thing is I don't have a break and I don't have a, a shear, so everything's been sawed or cut in another manner. So anyway, that's going to go on there like that. Now I'll make the bracket. Well, I was just thinking about this bracket here. First of all, this is a difficult bend to make if you're just using some band iron. Uh, a, a double bend back to back like that. There's just no way to do it without some kind of bending device. And uh, I don't want to get into that. And then I thought, well, I'll just make, uh, I'll extend this rod straight up. But I think the reason they allowed this is that so the, when the belt comes off track, which it more than likely is going to, you know how it tears up guards and things like that. and well, you can see here on the inside what uh, bandsaw and band sander type <laughs> blades do when they get off track. But my point here is probably at some point with careless operators, the belt is going to get off track and cut this in half if it doesn't have this extra clearance. In other words, it went straight up. So that's probably why they did it. But I'm going to do it... Uh, a little bit different since I have almost an infinite supply of this two inch by one inch. I'm going to cut that out on the bandsaw and uh, make a make a horseshoe out of this. That's basically what I'm going to do. Well, there's the little bracket. It took a little longer to make than what I thought, and it always does, doesn't it? So that'll be tightened down, of course. Remember, there's also a set screw in here at the bottom of this hole that is holding this axle shaft in place. There's the center line of the guard and I'll just determine exactly where that's going to be. Now it would, it would be nice to have this extend out farther and if this proves to be too uh, uh, rickety I'll do that but I want to locate this approximately in the center looking at it from here the center of the belt and perhaps two screws or two rivets whatever I guess I'll use screws that's the route I've been going 1024s so let me do that off camera that won't take long and that almost completes the project well there it is and sure enough some of that sheet metal does rattle just kind of as I expect that it just needs a little more support in, in this area. Maybe a little bit at the bottom, but you know how sheet metal is. So it needs a stiffener in there. Probably not going to get one, but I did put a spacer in here also, and that Loctite is setting up, but therefore the guard here doesn't press all the way up against the platen. But she's pretty much done. I had considered painting the guards yellow, just like the Kalamazoo, but I'm going to back off on that uh, because I have been working on this really for six weeks on and off, perhaps longer, including the wheel patterns and all. Now the wheels, uh, 3D patterns will be on Thingiverse. There will be links uh, showing you that. Thanks to Kevin Peterson for that. So it's on his uh, Thingiverse site. So anybody that uh, can cast wheels and wants to make one of these uh, can do so. If anyone actually does make one, let me know. Send me pictures of it. I understand that this is really for entertainment and very few people will. And it costs you probably as much to make this as it would to buy it because you have to come up with a motor unless you already have one in stock. But I'm reasonably satisfied with the way it turned out. 
Just a few safety warnings. Remember that an abrasive belt machine really is a type of grinder, so make sure that you wear either goggles or a full face shield when you use it, and be very careful. Don't let kids use this. Now there's so many ways of uh, hurting yourself on this that uh, you know I can't cover them all, but there are some things that, that uh, people do that breaks the belt or causes the work to get thrown back. So I su uh, suggest that you don't ever present your work like this into the, uh, the belt. Uh, you're better off putting it down like this. This has a tendency to want to kick it back or jam it and if it jams the belt literally explodes and that that happens so much at school that sometimes I just had to to shut these things down because uh, you couldn't afford the belts uh, you'd need 10 a day but uh, be also careful that you don't get anything caught between the tool rest and the belt that also causes the belt to get uh, uh, torn or or to break so especially with thinner work it'll get caught down in there and it happens so quickly keep your fingers away from it this will cut your finger off and that's why I put the guards remember that that these edges here are almost like a saw blade if you would run your hand into it so that's why I'm suggesting that these are used by adults only I saw so many accidents at the high school with these. Fortunately, most of them were minor accidents, so uh, take those few tips into consideration when you use yours. Now, if you're an old hand around the shop, I'm not telling you anything new, but we do ha always have some newbies that are watching these videos of mine. Remember that if you build this uh, in, in the correct configuration, you can also use it in the horizontal position. Right now this one's set up for vertical use only, but the Kalamazoo and many brands can be used in, in two positions. Remember when, I, remember when I talked about this earlier, if you uh, were, or if I were, to weld that on, again this part here would be removed. And if this was welded on and braced properly, the whole machine could be laid down into a horizontal position. And I'm not going to do that. I considered doing it because I have really... Uh, one of these down here in the basement, and also two of them out in the garage. The two, one's Kalamazoo and one is the Dayton. I think probably you have watched that video as well. So think about uh, th these other possibilities here. There's so many different ways of building this, not just the way that I did it. And some of you are probably even wondering, why did he do this? Why did he do that? Well, I, I had a reason, you know, it was either materials that I had or it was easier for me or I had uh, the, uh, the right machines to do it, but consider doing it uh, your, your own way. You're free to redesign this any way you want. When you need to order belts, remember this is 2 inch wide and 48 inches long, I generally buy 100 grit. It's just a very useful uh, grit for average uh, general purpose work. It's kind of a pain to change belts. So that's why it's nice to have several machines, but a number 100 belt is going to serve you well. If you're doing a lot of coarse work or, or with castings, you might want to go up to a, uh, or down to an 80 or even a 60. If you're doing work with knives and cutlery, then fine. But of course, you're going to need more than one grit if you're doing some of, the, of, the, of that type of, of job. And these belts are good for aluminum or steel. On all of my belt machines, I like this soft spot here, which I call the sweet spot. It's just beautiful for removing burrs. In fact, I use these abrasive belt machines not exclusively, but I, I just do a lot of deburring on them. They're just handier than heck. For me. Okay, 
just a few suggestions on how you can use your machine. And yes, this is my unfinished prototype, and this is a better motor to use, a totally enclosed motor that cannot draw the abrasive particles and grit into the motor itself. But this is a very expensive motor, and you probably could not design and build your machine around this unless you already had one of these, or you can get it cheap or use one. This is an open frame, as I talked about. And yes, it does suck the grit into the windings and into the switch. Is it good? No, but that is how a lot of them are made. However, the Kalamazoo Company does use this type of motor, this Baldor motor, a very nice motor. But if you look these up, that might be a three or four hundred dollar motor in a one horsepower. Remember, this is one and a half horse. This is only a one, uh, one half horse. You probably, I certainly don't need one and a half. I'm just using a motor that I had in stock in my junk pile, but yet it's a pretty good motor. It makes a little bit of noise, but it's just fine for what it is. So those are just some suggestions again on motors and what type you need to look for. These are single phase motors, 110 volt. All of us use a grounded plug. Well, that completes this video series, so if you haven't watched all of the parts, be sure and go back to tips number 510, which is part one, and then that is seven videos in a row. This is part seven, which is the conclusion, and quite a few hours of video. I start out by making the wheels. A lot of satisfaction that I felt in making this. Perhaps you can do the same. So this is Tubal Kane saying so long for now. Build some projects and I'll see you in my next video.